Welcome back to Building Tomorrow. I'm here with the entire regular crew this time, Matthew, Will, and Aaron. And if you're like us, you're probably just kicking back from a veritable Thanksgiving feast. You've stuffed your face with all the, well, stuffing and turducken and tofurkey and sweet potato casserole your gluttonous little stomach could desire. And after a goodly snooze or food coma, you're going to have to think about the choices you're going to make on the morrow for it is Black Friday, the busiest shopping day of the year. Or perhaps you're waiting for Cyber Monday so as to avoid being stampled, stampled, stomp, stomped, stumbled, trampled, 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 trampled by Just the keep going. hordes of shoppers. Either way, you need to buy something for the special people in your life, as well as your cousin Todd, who is the worst, but you'll feel bad if he gets you a present again this year and you got him nothing like last year when he, well, wherever I was. Yes, we're finding gifts. It is a staple of the tech media at this time of year to put out a hot tech gadgets for the nerds in your life list. It's fun, it's easy copy, lots of clicks, light reading. We're gonna do something slightly different here on Building Tomorrow. Rather than giving you a literal list of gadgets, we're going to proffer our suggestions of the top technologies and innovations that if they become the hot new tech toy of the season and were adopted en masse, uh, like, you know, a Tickle Me Elmo, but for, for tech toys, that would do the most to transform our lives for the better. We're going to stick to North American uh, tech and innovation because if we didn't, well, uh, as Aaron pointed out, we'd be airdropping smartphones, smartphones over the developing world. It would just win handily, like no competition, smartphones for everyone. Uh, that's not very interesting for a competition. So, uh, and we're also not going to do an exact gadget or company necessarily. We're thinking about the underlying tech, and we're going to vote for the winners. You guys, you can't vote for your own. You vote for someone else's. We can even, if we want to be real fancy, we can go like Maine and do ranked choice voting uh, in, the, in the spirit of last month. Uh, so let's kick things off with Will. What is your hot tech gadget? So I'm going to go with the Fitbit. And now a lot of you think of that as something you wear when you go on a run to track how far you've run or how high your heart rate went while you were doing it. But it has a much more universal, really health-centric potential applications. Um, so you wear a device that tracks your heart rate as well as other bio signs over time. Um, and it allows you to create a fairly comprehensive picture of how your body is behaving throughout the day, day in and day out. And this can allow either you or your doctor perhaps to begin to identify certain patterns um, that could then also potentially be aggregated with uh, other people's Fitbit data to see larger societal health patterns. Um, where are people sleeping well? What do people do before they sleep well versus when they don't have a good night's sleep? And you can provide for the fairly cheap collection of very interesting health data through, you know, what is now kind of got a boost the other year as a running killer app. Um, now they've been trying to move into the smartwatch and mobile payments market, but long term, you know, Fitbit itself as a as a goal. Um, sees the idea of building a service business related to digital health as uh, kind of the, the long-term quest for the product, as are others in that space. And um, firms more on the health side interested in making use of this data. Are you worried about the privacy implications of this, though? That this is, I mean, this is like by uh, definition, I mean, it, this is very personal you. data. Yes. Um, I, I am kind of ignoring that, ghosting over it for now. Obviously, another sort of running app um, that allowed people to compare their runs called Strava earlier this year uh, became a little bit notorious for effectively outlining the perimeters of military bases around the world because <laughs> as soldiers would jog the fence in the morning, they'd be comparing themselves to others who might have been posted there in the past. And all of this was being posted on the global Strava runs map. So you could see these little glowing lines around facilities, say in Syria, that officially didn't exist. 
Um, now, yes, there is obviously if you were to lose access or control over your individualized, that is non-anonymized Fitbit data, um, someone could know how you were sleeping, when you were active, if you had sex that night, um, just by looking at your heart rate and other biosigns over time. Um, so there, there is some concern there, but I think overall the benefits of being able to learn that about yourself, um, which is difficult otherwise, and also very expensive. People are sent in for sleep studies or to go and wear a heart monitor uh, over lunch for, for a week. Um, and these not only take folks out of the rest of their lives, a lot of people don't want to do that, take the time to do that, so they just don't get the treatment they perhaps would otherwise. Um, and it, it simplifies all of this collection. I would think in theory you can aggregate this, right? So you can strip out identifying personal information and being like you're then being compared against a faceless mass of data. Kind of like you do with 23andMe. Like, yes, in theory, 23andMe, there's a there's a risk of privacy breach if that information gets leaked about your genetic makeup. But they strip out your personal identifying information so that other people can be compared not against you as an individual, but against the uh, aggregated profile. And so I imagine the same yeah, thing can you, be true Yeah, you can here. identify local trends that way yeah. as well. How much worse are people sleeping thanks to the new highway built yeah. next to their, their development? Yeah. Um, and you aren't then dealing just with individual anecdotes from people in that community, but you can really look at how long they were sleeping for, how long they were in REM cycles across um, numerous individuals so within this, that space. This is kind and of, you have natural control groups as well. Yeah. Well, so this is like a case of something that's underutilized right now. I mean, like I, lots of people have Fitbits, but they're it's kind of like they're glorified step counters. In a sense. Yes. Um, the, the infrastructure that you would need to, um, for these sort of health-facing or health-centric applications isn't there yet. It's coming, um, but obviously the wider Fitbit and, and similar devices are adopted now, the more of a market there will be for those sorts of uses of that data down the road. And uh, if you buy all of your relatives a, a Fitbit for Christmas, then we can move uh, incrementally towards that healthier world. Nice. All right. I like it. So our first entry here is uh, the Fitbit, uh, maybe not specifically, but a Fitbit-like device, a health tracker um, for improving uh, consumer health. Uh, our next entry is a little bit different. So it's not a literal device. It's software rather than uh, uh, device innovation. Uh, it's end-to-end -end encryption. Do I have that right, Feeney? No one wants to get software for Christmas. <laughs> No one wants to be told that they're overweight and slow for Christmas. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, unlike the previous nomination, this one actually takes privacy into account. So uh, if I could uh, airdrop uh, devices or software to uh, families in America, it would be services that allow for people to engage in end-to-end -end encrypted communication. Uh, there are services out there such as ProtonMail and Tutanota, which are email services that allow people to end-to-end and encrypt their emails. There are messaging services like uh, Signal and Wicker, Wire, that I know all four of us use uh, here at Cato. And uh, the great thing about this is it's easy to use, uh, low cost, uh, but with very uh, with very high benefits, uh, a lot of great benefits, uh, namely uh, protection against surveillance. Uh, the uh, the the sad state of affairs is that uh, emails don't enjoy as much protection as we would like, uh, thanks to uh, legislation and Supreme Court precedent. So, in the name of privacy and increased security, and uh, I would uh, wish that uh, everyone uh, around Thanksgiving tables and uh, Christmas gatherings. Uh, and everything in between, uh, sign up for a low cost or even free end-to-end -end encrypted service. That's uh, my nomination. So you go into your, uh, you know, uh, grand grandma's email account, set her up with a with a, a VPN client or a or a Tor or something, and here you go, grandma. Here's your. Yeah, I mean, it depends how much you uh, want to get into the weeds. You know, you yeah, could do yeah, a yeah. whole lot of. Uh, 
<laughs> you could you could really go a little crazy with services like this. But uh, in fact, many listeners probably already use this technology and don't know it if they use WhatsApp, uh, Facebook Messenger, uh, iMessage, right? Uh, but I think it's worth people, you know, getting out there to see uh, the other cool services that are out there. Uh, so that would be my uh, my holiday wish. That's pretty good. Uh, any anyone care to piggyback on back on top of that? I mean, so Wills, so Wills has the the effects. There's all these health effects that in the aggregate, and if, if everyone's using this stuff, but for the the consumer, for the person who gets the Fitbit, aside from if it tells them that they're wildly out of shape and just makes them depressed, but that you get that it's kind of a it's a it's a neat little thing for the person to have. Um, is that the case with the end to end encrypted? Like, so are you basically saying? Grandma, I'm going to switch you from Gmail to Proton Mail, and the the there's no real benefit to you in terms of like the day to day use, um, like, but but it means that you're more secure. Like, does this does it make sense? That like, what's the kind of consumer hook that makes the consumer want to use this stuff outside of? We in this room are all paranoid libertarians who don't want the government snooping. No, well, I don't think that <clears throat> privacy and security is something that only paranoid libertarians need or desire. And uh, it's true that it's not as easy uh, to to show off in a coffee shop that you have uh, you have to probably open up your your smartphone and show the 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 app. And some people might think, isn't that just you know that not that much different from Gmail, right? And also Until, signal with stickers like you have all over the back of your laptop. Yeah, uh, I I like um, I like stickers on my laptop. Laptop, uh, <laughs> and then they make sure to really work you over at security. Right. Uh, I, I don't know. I've um, been for rather happy with how I've been treated uh, by uh, the federal government's um, airport security personnel. The accent makes you come off as trustworthy. I don't usually talk during this, <laughs> um, but yes, uh, I, I I get what you're saying. It's not a, a a new product in the way that a Fitbit is. You can't hold it in your hand, a, an orb of encryption, right? You can't do that. But I think the selling point uh, is enough to get people interested. Uh, of course, uh, if you go to grandma and say, "Hey, uh, here's a, a free." Tutanoda or Proton Mail account, and they say, "Oh, why do I need that?" I guess it's a good excuse to talk about the sad state of affairs when it comes to privacy in the United States. But yeah, it's not something you can flash around. Uh, that's for sure. Do you see any physical products designed to offer those sorts of services, like either a, a router you can buy that attempts to encrypt everything that runs through it, or even I don't know. I'm, I'm imagining some kind of 5G hotspot you can wear as a necklace that. You know, then your phone <laughs> connects to that, and uh, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not it'd make uh, it sexier in a way. You I could have an orb of encryption. Yeah, maybe uh, it would also put you on a few more radars, I suppose. If there was, uh, you know, no one can look at my iPhone and see that I have certain apps or services, right? And uh, I'm pretty happy with that state of affairs. I have to say, uh, I mean, to some extent, though, they. I mean, you mentioned the iPhone that. That is exactly what you're describing. I mean, this is a device, and this is this is the case for other. I mean, I think Android phones do this now too. That the whole device itself, everything on it, is encrypted and doesn't decrypt until you enter in your passcode. Um, and and the default messaging service that it comes with, iMessage, which I think is one of, if you consider messaging services like as social networks, it's one of the largest social networks in terms of like daily traffic in the U.S. Well, I think. Uh, an added benefit to at least my uh, my present proposal is that it prompts uh, excuses for interesting conversations, uh, and I don't want to, you know, That's... bash Google necessarily, right? Uh, so uh, Google produces products that a lot of people like and are really good and easy to use. Uh, but I think if if you actually introduced every adult in America to the kind of interesting companies and services that are out there, we would just live in a more interesting world uh, with people actually having more um, urgent conversations about security and privacy. So here, here's maybe a selling point to, to get the, uh, you know, the, the security skeptical, the, the folks who aren't paranoid enough, like good rational folks like us. Uh, you can hook them on the idea of uh, ISP switching, right? So you can say, hey, look, do you like the shows that you see on, on, on ne I mean, Netflix or on Amazon Prime or on any of these other services? Well, did you know that if you just use a VPN client or an ISP switching client, you can access a whole new world 
of of content on other national Netflixes, other shows. You can watch football games for free. You can watch right. So all of which is is legal. It's not illegal to uh, uh, mask your ISP, basically what your computer identifies itself as. So not only are you giving them security, they're using a, a, a client that obscures who they are and what they're doing on the internet. You're also giving them access to do stuff, stuff that ordinary consumers like and want. So uh, something I will add, not that I think I need to, because I think I'm probably getting more votes than Fitbit at this point, but we'll, we'll see. We should attach a survey <laughs> Good to luck. this. So we'll see. Uh, I find, and this is totally anecdotal, that there's this uh, frustrating degree of uh, reluctance to do anything about the state of surveillance. You know, the, the Snowden revelations come out and everyone sort of rolls their eyes and they think, well, what am I supposed to do about that? You know, the, I can't give up email and I'm not going to stop using the internet or my phone and I'm not going to stop going outside. So what should I do about this? And actually, I think not enough people know that there are really cheap, low cost, low barrier to entry ways of protecting themselves, uh, but very few, comparatively few people do it. And I think that's a shame. Your decoder ring costs about $3 and you can get pigeons for free anywhere. Right. Well, you're only allowed to have one nomination, Will, and so you can't <laughs> put right. in coding one. rings and pigeons as well. Well, yeah. and, and to your point, I mean, the, it's actually gone pretty mainstream, the idea that you shouldn't just leave your laptop camera uh, yeah. unexposed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's now become ordinary for folks to tape over it. Now manufacturers are building in little slot, like yeah, physical yeah. manual slides. So something that five years ago people people did respond to with, like, what's wrong with you, paranoi paranoiacs, like, yeah, that you're yeah. worried about that? It's that stuff can become ex uh, accepted and even expected. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, end-to-end -end encryption is one of those things that you can see it's in the near future. People are just gonna demand it as a matter of course. Hope so. so yeah. Well, th there's a natural segue I think here between what Matthew's proposing with end-to-end -end encryption and Aaron, your idea. So pitch us your gift of the season. Sure, so this does pick up kind of with the end-to-end -end encryption and expands upon it a fair amount, which is, um, the decentralized web. And so my if the products that I pick is decentralized web browsers slash clients. Um, so there's there's a number of them out there. There's the status.im is one. Um, I think Coinbase has Coinbase Wallet, I believe it's called, that is another um, that used to be called Tashi was the the product that I think they bought. But there's there's a handful of these things. And Basically, what they are is a crypto wallet, um, usually an Ethereum wallet that can hold Ethereum tokens of various kinds, um, a end-to-end -end encrypted messaging platform that's sometimes built on um, their open protocols that are kind of part of the – associated with Ethereum that it gets built on, and then an ability to connect to what are called decentralized web apps, which are basically like regular web pages, but the the data, your data as you're browsing them, as you're using them, as you log into them is controlled by you. Um, so you're not really they're, – they're kind of spread out more than – and and they're the way that they're run is different so that they're harder to shut down. There isn't you know a centralized server that someone could go and like turn off all of Facebook because it's it's living across different things. Um, <clears throat> so you get you get the effects that Matthew is talking about. I mean, you could not it's not email, it's it's instant messaging, but you could certainly you could build a decentralized email platform of a sort into this thing and have access to it. And these are usually mobile apps, but there's desktop versions as well. Um, but you also are getting the 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 crypto thing, so you can do things like you know, basically. So status has what amounts to Venmo, like a Venmo client, but you're sending each other Ethereum tokens or other kinds of tokens instead. Um, and you can be browsing what looks like you know the regular web, but is in this kind of decentralized, more private, uh, more robust setup that you know is is less accessible to like government snooping, government shutting down, and so on. Um, Will rolled his eyes when oh. I when I mentioned this. Um, I was just going to ask whether uh, Mastodon would uh, it does does that meet your high bar for What's decentralized Mastodon? services? It's an attempt to decentralize Twitter, so anyone can create their own Mastodon server and run a Mastodon instance, which is like 
It's down basically Twitter it's community. basically like kind of email reskinned to be Twitter. So your mm. you servers would be like having an email server, but then they can the servers can talk to each other. So you can you know your your tweets on it get sent out to the other people who are following you. Um, and so you can switch servers and different servers can have different rules about, you know, this is the kind of content we're going to moderate or we're going to allow or, you know, this is the advertising we're going to show or not. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the the difference with these these D apps is that they have they have the um, the wallet address is part of it that you have you kind of have an identity that you can carry between them that's based on your the keys in your wallet and tied to payments somehow it can be tied to payments because um, it's the same wallet address that is the wallet address for payments but so there's there's slightly technical there's technical differences on the back end but if from the consumer standpoint these are similar sorts of things um, and I picked this one so in part because the the conceit of this episode was if if this was what was given to everyone yeah what would you you know like so that you kind of are waving your magic wand and suddenly everyone in the US is using this thing and right now these products i fully confess kind of suck like there's you know the, as as instant messengers they're a little bit slow compared to other to to you know facebook messenger or whatever they don't have as many features the apps are a little bit uh, feel more in development um, a lot of them are still in beta status, and no one uh, else is on them. It's hard to talk not to your friends people... on these things when they're all still on Facebook. Sure. So, so, but all of those are issues that are, get overcome <laughs> by <Steve>. conceit. <laughs> by the conceit, which is if everyone's using it, then all of your friends are on it, and just like with the web, um, the the re the original web, you know, once lots and lots of people started using it, we started seeing really rapid development in the space. And so this is so if I can make everyone in the US kind of start using this thing, it kickstarts that development. But I think as far as the benefits of this, um, again, kind of picking up from Matthews is this allows us if we did this, then kind of by default, all or most of us would be having the majority of our digital communications in an encrypted space. We would be doing it in a way, we would be interacting with the web in a way that where we own our data, have control over our data, and it's again less accessible to surveillance. And all of this would be plugged into an economic system that would allow us to have economic relationships with each other, whether that's paying your part of rent or you know, paying at the restaurant or sending reimbursing your friend for something or buying products online that's happening in this privacy respecting decentralized fashion that's outside of the reach of governments. And so in in kind of one little app, it allows us to take an extraordinary portion of our digitally mediated lives and just move it out of the political sphere, move it out of the state sphere and move it into a place that I think is much more liberty respecting. I wonder if the participation in all of this is a, is a selling point. So I guess the conceit of the episode is we just assume everyone grabs it. But it reminds me a little bit of the, the Tor network that the more people that participate in this, the, the better it becomes. And you don't have to be a computer scientist to contribute to these interesting systems. Uh, necessarily, you can just be be a part of it and know that you're contributing. And some of the more exciting applications of the stuff I think Aaron is talking about are uh, anti censorship uh, applications, which would be pretty cool, uh, especially when you consider uh, governments like uh, the Chinese that uh, <laughs> are, are pretty keen on censorship. Uh, so this sort of decentralized. Uh, nature of it, I think, is a big selling point. You can tell people that they're actually taking part in a really in a great social good without having to, you know, have to quit their job or to donate a huge amount of money. They can, in virtue of being just part of the network, they're they're contributing. I mean, it's not an unalloyed good, I guess, given what we expect to go on, what happens in the. Yes, I, I, yes, I don't know the the tour comment. Uh, you know, there you can use Tor, and then you can help to cover for government spies. And if you're a good patriotic person, maybe you really enjoy that. But if you're skeptical as to how the U.S. behaves around the world, um, well, look, uh, angels different. and demons are going to use every new piece of technology, and uh, there are there are costs to 
uh, our privacy and our security uh, with all different kinds of technology. Uh, I'm certainly willing to put that in the cost column, but we shouldn't forget the the huge number of benefits too. I would also say that I mean, with the exception of Fitbit, um, the these are tech that the demons are already using. Like, so we're not, you know, this isn't tech that we've kind of made up out of whole cloth. It's already out there. You can, you can download, you can use Tor right now if you want to. You can run ProtonMail if you want to. You can download the status client and run it on your phone right now if you want to. Um, and so people, people who have a strong incentive to be using this stuff because they're up to no good are already using it. So simply asking lots and lots of more people to use it means that you're just you're likely to be bringing in a whole bunch of people who aren't going to be using it for no good. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, this also reminds me of something else. I think we have the difference here between the concrete and the my own example will be concrete as well, the Fitbit or the smart diapers I'll be talking about, or and then encryption and uh, a decentralized internet that which is more abstract. I mean, it's it's. And also, it only works because of our conceit. Because if it comes to uh, small scale innovation, you need to give consumers a reason to buy. I mean, they're more likely to say, I want to buy this thing because, in isolation, if I have it, my life is better, versus I'm going to buy this hoping a million other people buy it and then we'll all benefit with, with scale, right? So the conceit of the episode is necessary for this to happen. But it makes you wonder with the original internet, right? So how do you go from uh, only essentially government uh, uh, and researchers, you know, academic researchers and the government using the early stages of the internet to mass adoption. I mean, because we had to go, we had to bridge that abstract divide at one point 20, 30 years ago, right? And, uh, but then again, there was kind of a killer app in the sense of, remember what you circulated? If you wanted to get your grandma surfing online, what did you that AOL disk? Yes, exactly. You deluge them with like free internet time, the little disks, AOL online. Um, I think that's the first time I've heard anyone say anything good about I, that in I decades. Yeah. It's all going to be counterintuitive here, but there was something good about which was that it was an entry point for folks who weren't they weren't they were not they're not thinking about can I build this thing called the web. 1.0 that will benefit all of society through rapid innovation and joining us together. No, they're thinking, oh, if I get this physical CD and load up my computer and click on this stuff, I can like chat with well, people. They, in they the chat advertised room. that. I mean, looking at early right. internet advertising can be fascinating because they really are selling not just their service, but the idea of the internet as a yeah. product. Um, the old what was it? E trade or there's a video of Bill Clinton when he's in it. It's right at the end of his second term, lame duck, and uh, Hillary leaves him to go campaign, and he's bumming around the White House, and he has an intern teaching him how to use the internet, and they're mimicking a popular internet commercial of the time. Uh, we can put that up in the, yeah, the show we'll notes. Have to. It's a, a fun one looking as at long as how this intern, thing was sold. As long as the intern wasn't Monica Lewinsky. Ah, uh, no, it was a dude. Okay. It was all, all fine. Um, <laughs> oh, um, but I mean, again, there you have the illustration, right? Like there has to be a, an entry point into this abstract thing. And so but I, I, what, some of the things you're mentioning, Aaron, like the ability to have a crypto wallet that is easy to use, easy to exchange. Uh, in a way that can't be tracked by whoever, by you know, ad companies, by corporations, by the government. What you're spending money on online—that's an entry. But people get why that might that could have value. So I think that's a that's a key way of thinking about that. Well, why don't we return to something a bit more uh, grounded? Um, it my my killer product for this holiday season is something that I think all parents uh, will appreciate, or if people have had kids in the past. Um, you know, most kids, you know, you don't want a lump of coal in your stocking at Christmas. But all I want for Christmas is to avoid a lump of something else in my kids' diapers. <laughs> How long did he spend writing that joke? <laughs> Almost <laughs> ten he, seconds. He pulled out. He's got it written down. <laughs> I got it written down. It was that. It was that important to me that I get that out. But okay, so Aaron will get this as someone who has kids. I get this as someone who has a kid. Uh, being a parent is both incredibly amazing and the worst at the same time. And the worst part about being a parent, at least for the first couple of years, is changing diapers, right? Like that's it. Kids, oh, I thought it was the sleep deprivation. 
I, I, well, there, there, it's like maybe a close Ch- changing diapers while sleep deprived is certainly a <laughs> that's, poor yeah, combination. Yeah, that's not a great combination either. When you like you're so sleep deprived, you drop the diaper that you just changed, and yeah, um, kids produce an astonish, astonishingly amount of incredibly disgusting substances, and that's like you. That's what you're dealing with when you change diapers, and you know when you change them. Anyone who's who's changed a diaper knows. He, Here's the process for for you guys who don't have kids. It's you've been an hour or two since the last diaper change. You start getting suspicious. It's time for another. You know, you 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 think you see an abnormal bulge in the in the in the pants of your kid. Uh, is it though just a little urine that can be ignored safely for an hour or two, or is it you know did they drop some poo and you have to change it or else it's gonna just create a massive mess. You have to check. So you start with the sniff test. You just stick your nose there and take a good old whiff. And uh, that's the first diagnosis test. And if that fails, you have to, you you, you go spelunking. You, you try to check in the back of the diaper to see if you see something, right? Like it is unpleasant. This is a deeply unpleasant thing, but you have to do it or else your kid will get rashes. Your kid will create messes. It's just part of parenting. So my uh, killer innovation uh, for this holiday season. It's actually from a new uh, outfit called Verily, which is actually under the Google Alphabet umbrella company. It's their life sciences division. But they patented a smart diaper that will be able to distinguish between urine and poop. It will measure conductivity, impedance, temperature in the fibers of the diaper itself to detect the presence of liquids and solids. So all the diapers would come with that sensing fiber built in and then you'd have like a detachable uh, relay that would send the information to an app on your smartphone. So you change kid's diaper, you pop the little relay on and you will know like real time, live updates, has your kid gone? What have they done? Do I need to change them now? And like the amount of mess and frustration, unpleasant sniffing that you would have to do as a parent would go down dramatically if you just knew that information. Like it sounds like a small thing compared to a new web or like better health outcomes for you uh, with your with your Fitbit or uh, avoiding government surveillance. But when it comes to like the lived experience of millions of parents in this country, uh, having that kind of information makes your life quantifiably better on a day-to-day basis. I think you've given a great pitch, but at this point, only five people are still listening. This <laughs> description. Hey, of, I like the. Was, I'm, I like it. I. You uh, know, anytime I'm we just can gonna be, claim the win, right? Now. Yeah, anytime. everyone just ate lots of uh, turkey, and now I you're feel hurting. slightly. Okay, I'm glad I. <laughs> You'll ate have kids a while soon, Matthew. <laughs> um, anytime you can be pro tech and pro natalism, that that seems good to me. Now, how does this? Uh, w- I hear Google involved in this. What what kind of data do they get from this? Is is there when you open a, a up the diaper to change it, interaction? You see an ad. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, are we getting like literally cradle to grave data collection now, where they use that to predict future behaviors about you? You know, how long did it take for you to become potty trained, et cetera? What does that say about impulse control and on? Um, well, I mean, in a, in a less a dystopian vision of that would be like, hey, we know how many diapers you've changed. So we know you're running out of diapers. It's time for your automatic subscription to diapers on Amazon to s- ship you a, a package. Um, you could also imagine a use case where you say, like, as that tech gets more advanced, it's not just detecting what did they do. It's detecting, like, uh, information about, well, does your kid have uh, like a stool uh, sample stool, right there? Yeah, it's essentially doing stool sampling, giving information that goes to their doctor, to your pediatrician who can monitor it like, oh, no, they've had, you know, they might have diarrhea and it's time for you to bring them in for dehydration to check. Like this could actually improve health outcomes for kids as well. Uh, and it's not just kids. I was thinking, too, you know, who else wears lots of diapers? It's the elderly folks in nursing homes, in hospices who, especially if they're senile, can't do this for themselves. And there's a real dignitary benefit, I think, as well to th- this knowledge being provided by the diaper rather than an elder care provider having to look down the back of a 75 year old man's drawers. Like that, yeah. there's a dignitary harm in that. And no one's really comfortable with it and it's unpleasant. Um, and, and to receive it in uh, the form of more sanitized data, I think, would make the experience more pleasant. 
Um, well, well, and too, there in that use case, um, there's a sense that so so one of the big um, there's lots of really bad health outcomes that apply to the elderly. So. Uh, like when it's a baby, if you don't change your diaper soon enough, they get a diaper rash, which is unpleasant. They're uncomfortable. They scream and holler, and it makes your life miserable. And so it's good if you can mitigate that. But with the elderly, if you don't change them often enough, uh, they get bed sores. They like urinary tract infections. It kills them. I mean, oftentimes those are shocks to the system that kill the elderly. Like the n number of times that elderly, senile elderly folks in nursing homes die because they just weren't changed often enough is higher than you'd think. So it, this is tech that could save lives as well and, and, and pro provide better quality of life too. So that's my pitch. It's, I guess, in the Fitbit kind of category of a more literal device. You're definitely going to win now because everyone doesn't want to be anti-old people and babies. <laughs> yes. So you're definitely going to win. My, mine is still the best thing to receive in a box under the tree. That's true. Um, we have instructions to download something <laughs> or diapers. It's the thought Versus, that counts. And, and, I mean, and, that you, and can you, can make, you can make small Fitbits for babies. So Will can get yes. in on that. Yeah. Or maybe we should just put the Fitbit in the diaper. It is the relay. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. All right. So uh, off air, we have written down our selections, but we're going to go around and announce them live. So Aaron, let's start off with you. I got to give my vote, seeing as I can't vote for myself, uh, which mine is obviously the best. If any of yours were better than mine, that's what I would have chosen <laughs> as mine. But um, I'm going to start with Matthew. Woohoo! Just because in in the my you know ranking of values, the stick it to the state and end surveillance it's stuff. Just software is... eating everyone else's Christmas gifts. <laughs> You're buying them a gift certificate to something. Um, so I'm going to pick my first vote. It goes to Matthew's end end encrypted communications. Um, my second vote goes to Paul's diapers just simply because I went through three children of my own and this sounds like it would have made things marginally easier. Yeah. Uh, is it me now? I'll yes. Use, All yeah. right. Uh, because I cannot vote for myself, but I also want to stick it to the state. My first vote goes to Aaron's Web 2.0. Uh, I'm not a parent, but I may be in the future, and in the future, I want there to be as little mess as possible. And I also don't want to come across as anti-old people or babies. <laughs> so my second vote goes to Paul. All right. Well, first vote, vote to uh, Paul with the uh, smart diapers. I hey, natalism wins, man. Um, <laughs> I should have found a way in this of, election and more generally. Should have found a way of working puppies in there too. Diapers for puppies. Uh, <laughs> we don't. We don't. We just need kids, not people getting dogs as kids. Um, and I think, secondly, I'll I'll go for Aaron's D apps. Um, it feels like it kind of includes a lot of Matthew's proposal as well, but it's more expansive and uh, yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, I have Web 2.0 errands for my first vote and then second for Fitbit. Oh, finally. So you got, you got, Someone. You got on the board. <laughs> Will's on the board. And I think our big, uh, it's all going to come down to Tess, I suspect here. So uh, this is our producer, Tess. You have heard her voice maybe a time or two. But weigh in, Tess. Give us the all-important fifth vote. Okay. Well, we're tied with Web 2.0 and diapers. So my first vote is going to go to encryption. Thank you. And my second vote are tiebreaker, though I'm not sure how this is going to promote the general welfare and building a better future tomorrow, I'm going to go with diapers. Woo All right. Buy a hair. I think diapers has it. Kind of. Though diapers only had one first place vote and three second place votes and Web 2.0 had two first place votes and one second. So I think that gives it to me. <laughs> nah. On ranked choice, it might. Yeah. If you give like two points for every first point every first vote and then only one point for a second vote. Do you see what does. I mean? Yeah, it does go yeah. to Aaron then with then, five yeah. points versus four for diapers. This is the kind of procedure we should have thought through before oh. recording. You know oh, what no. else we should probably yeah. mention in full disclosure because now I'm bitter. Um, Aaron is Tess's boss and uh, <laughs> I just want to make sure the listeners know this. <laughs> it's a dirty pool here. Yeah. A dirty pool. <laughs> 
Well, that was good. Well, thank you uh, all for listening to Building Tomorrow. And uh, now you have some ideas for what to put under the tree. And probably it's not going to be any of these <laughs> any of these things. Uh, and until next week, be well and happy Thanksgiving. Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy our show, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn about Building Tomorrow or to discover other great podcasts, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.